so yesterday we talked about control more from a theoretical and high-level standpoint in terms of how controls attend to robotics and why we need controllers in order to implement semi-autonomous and autonomous capabilities on robots. We went through the cruise control example just as a, a motivator and to give it some something a little less abstract. Um, what are the just to recap real quick? What are the two main branches of control that we talked about right at the beginning? Yes. Open and close. Open and close loop. Do you want to take a crack at what the difference is? Um, when it's closed, it has a feedback loop, so yes. it's like an open in a circle. Sort of an open, more simple way to go. Open right. is input, output, which is U and Y, and you have your plan, which could, in our case, be the vehicle. Yes, that's that's right. So in, in your case, the plan would be the vehicle, the thing that's under control. Um, and, and like your colleague said, in the case of closed loop, you have something called feedback, where you're taking uh, a measurement of the output, right, an estimate, and you're feeding that back into the controller. In the case of open loop, you're somewhat blind, which is why I particularly like the example of driving cruise control with my eyes closed, because that's that's what open loop control is, is. You're not getting that feedback information, so if you're off, there's no way for the controller to know that. We talked about some cases where sometimes it's actually advantageous to do open loop control or closed loop control, however, when people talk about control, it's almost understood implicitly that we're talking about closed loop control. Okay, so today what I want to do is, right off the bat, I want to just talk a little bit more about some of the stuff um, that we've worked on at JPL, particular stuff that I work on, because uh, like I was saying yesterday, one of the reasons I'm here is to be a resource for you guys, to, to answer your questions, to tell you about what it's like to work in the field of robotics right now. Again, you guys are the next generation of robotics engineers. So you'll be, you know, in, in, when you're 28 like me, you'll be up here talking about control systems and robotics, and you'll have a different perspective than I do. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Does anybody know, just looking around, who's gotten here before I call my name? Oh, okay. Very limited connection to the robot. 
So we couldn't joystick it around, just like the example of Mars that we were talking about yesterday. This was to try to push autonomy onto the robot. So here's what a, a high-speed time lapse of this looks like. We'll go take a look. I'll, I'll talk while it's going. So there are eight tasks in this competition, and you had an hour to complete them. At least was the goal. The first task was to get to the disaster site, so the robot had to be in the vehicle, um, and you had to, to drive it to the disaster site 200 meters away. That got you one point. Then you had to get out of the vehicle. This was the second point. So this is our 28 degree of freedom four-limb quadruped. So it can walk, but then also it can sit on rear wheels and drive. <laughs> Why walk if you can drive? Then opening the door was a third point, a third task. You had to go in, find a valve, open the valve. The next task, this was a surprise task. They didn't tell us what it was ahead of time until right before. It was to flip that electrical switch. This by far was the hardest manipulation task. It was to pick up a cordless D-wall drill and cut a hole in drywall with it. This is hard to do if you're a human. That drill is not designed to cut sideways. Um, so that's the... That was the fifth task. The sixth was to either clear this rubble or walk over the terrain. For us, it was really easy to drive through it. The, that was the sixth, uh, seventh task. The last task was to walk up the set of stairs. This is the only thing that Robert Simeon didn't do that day. And what it came down to for us, why we didn't walk up those stairs, was testing time. So you're going to you learn, and it sounds like maybe you've already started to learn a little bit, what it's like to work with real hardware and real software. It's, it's not necessarily easy. You may have an idea in your head of what you want to implement, and it's something very simple. But the reality of when you get it on the hardware is very different. Things don't work the way you expected, and now you have to debug. And it's that debugging process that costs so much time. So when we were using this robot, we had this robot fully functional six weeks before the competition, the, the full thing. Not a lot of time, but you might think, oh, it's only eight tasks. Like, you should be able to just get through all of them. No. Since the stairs were the last task, we kicked it all the way out to the end and said, we're not going to work on those until we get to the, you know, unless we actually get there. And we did this. <clears throat> so we couldn't walk up the stairs. So um, that's just an example of one of the more advanced robots we're working on right now. And what's very interesting about this challenge is if now, so a lot of people commuted, uh, competed with humanoid robots. Um, if you look up videos by a company called like Boston Dynamics, You'll see robots way advanced beyond this. But the thing is, that advancement happened because of this challenge. This challenge pushed the community to get to that point where we could build much more advanced robots. So just a little historical thing. that very much had an impact in the robotics community and will impact you either, like, even if indirectly. The other reason I want to mention this is, yesterday, what was... What was the control technique we talked about that I said is the most widely used in industry? PID, yeah. Do you think there's PID running on RoboSimian? Yes. Yes, absolutely. There are 28 joints on that robot. Each one has a motor in it. Each motor is something called an encoder. The encoder gives us position knowledge of the motor. And the way we control the motor to a position set point is with a PID control. In fact, it's, it's actually a cascaded loop of three PID controls. We also do something called force control with this robot, where we have, uh, at the end of the arm, there's a force sensor. So if I want to push against the environment with a certain amount of force, or um, you know, pull down on a lever until I hit a certain amount of force, we have a PID controller for that as well. Any questions on that guy? Yes? The DARPA challenge, does it change every year? Um, so the, the DARPA... Uh, it, it actually is a is a, a one event kind of thing. So the the, the way DARPA works is they say we're going to do this competition. In, in this case, it was a two stage. There were trials and finals. But then their goal is to push the community to advance their technology and then just pick it up and run with it. And then they kind of back off. So their idea is to provide a relatively for this advancement small amount of funding to get everybody together and focused. And then once the community gets rolling, then they back away. So next time they'll do a different kind of competition. It won't be, it won't be like this. And if you go back in time, 2004, 2005, there's something called the Darker Grand Challenge, where it was autonomous driving. And a lot of the technology that you guys are working with and the open source packages in ROS came out of that competition directly. You have something called the Haikuyo Lidar on your vehicles, right? 
Those used to be like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Not because they're really expensive to make, but because nobody was buying them. So manufacturing-wise, the volume was very low. So the companies had to charge a lot to make a profit. After that competition, and Google started doing autonomous driving, and then other people did, and now it's like every company in the world is working on autonomous driving, the cost has come way, way down to the point that you can buy those sensors for a course like this. It used to not be the case, not very long ago. Okay. So with that, what I want to do today is talk in more practical terms about control, particularly as it applies to your vehicle and sensor speed, and how you might implement uh, some of the controls we talked about yesterday for the wall following case. Have you guys talked about the wall following controller at all? Yeah. A little bit? Okay. So I think the idea is you have your car driving along the wall and you want to just maintain a distance from the wall so that you go in a straight line. Oh. So we'll talk about how we do that. Before I start, are there any lingering questions from yesterday? Okay. As always, feel free to stop me anytime along the way. All right. Let me just draw on the board here. The open versus closed loop controllers, just so we always have them up there as a frame of reference. So in the case of open loop, like we talked about um, just a few minutes ago, the reference comes into your controller, the controller spits out an input U to your plant, and you get some output. The output is not fed back to the controller. So if the controller is wrong about what it's trying to do, it has to be able to that. In the case of feedback, we have this what's called summation block. And here, I'm just going to write EST for estimation. We feed back an estimate of the output that we're trying to control, and we subtract it away from our reference to produce what? Oh, and I forgot something. What did I forget? The controller. So we get an error. The error feeds into the controller. What's different here? Well, here it's just a reference. It's where do I want to go? Here, embedded in the error term is both where do I want to go and where am I right now. That's the key distinction. Okay, this is looking good. tasked with the problem of you have this autonomous vehicle and yes. Sorry, so I look at close of like what your notification is, but like when you're actually coding it, it's as simple as like you subtract the estimation from the actual like R. Like, like I don't see the notification now like a plus and minus there. So like you just subtract the estimation um, from the actual R on your own thing and so you determine the error. In most cases yes. So in the case of PID, like we're going to talk about, yes, you, you literally just say like, I want to be a meter away from the wall. How far away am I from the wall right now? Okay, half a meter, then my error is half a meter. And that feeds into your controller. Yes, there are more advanced ways to do this outside the scope of this course. And there are also cases where you have what are called multiple input, multiple output systems. Where you're not just trying to track the distance from the wall. Maybe you're simultaneously trying to track your speed something like that. And so you can have this line becomes multiple outputs, and this becomes multiple references. And so then what happens here gets a little bit more complicated. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So, like we're saying, you're tasked with the job of taking, taking your RC vehicle, which is fitted out with sensors and software, and driving a straight line. Why? And we're going to do that by following the wall. Why don't we follow the wall? So that we can drive a straight line. Okay. So let's look at just a diagram of what that looks like. 
So we have your RC car. Let's say you're driving at some speed with some velocity v. So this is like your linear speed forward. And then over here you have a wall. And what you want to do is maintain a distance from the wall. How far we are away right now, let's call that D. This is our current distance. And we want D to be equal to some value. R, right? Our reference is what we want. Another common notation it controls is once you're, once you're in the implementation side where you're talking about real values, right? Reference here could be anything. This could mean anything. Temperature of the room, speed of the car, distance, velocities, whatever. A typical notation would be to call this D desired. Your desired value for D. And then this guy is D actual. Actually, you know what? Instead of actual, let's call it estimated. Just to hammer the point home that you have you have a lidar on the car, right? I think you, you guys work the lidar a bit. Someone want to explain to the class how does that lidar work? Yes. It like it shoots lasers and it like calculates how long it takes a laser to come back. And so you don't actually like know the actual like, exact distance, but just rather what the sensor says it is, so it's estimated. Right. Right. Exactly. So it's estimated. Yeah. You don't ever actually get to know how far away your car is from the wall. What if you had a tape measure? Could you measure it perfectly? No. Nope. Nope. And this is the thing in robotics of how do you get what's called ground truth? How do you actually know that you're doing the right thing if you can't measure it? Well, one way you do it is you put a cheap sensor on the robot and you estimate your distance with the robot. And then to see if you're at least in the ballpark, you buy a really expensive what's called metrology system which allows you to track the vehicle and its distance from the wall and say we're at least within 0.1 millimeters and that's sufficient for this, this task. That's typically how this would go. So the idea is you're estimating D here. You don't actually know. You, but you have a very highly educated guess. Okay, so the control objective is simple. What is, what is the control objective here? While driving along the wrong, right? So we want D estimate to equal D desired. That's the whole goal. Okay. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> In the simplest sense, right now my car is pointing to the right, and I have some distance that I am away from the wall that I'm estimating. And I have some distance that I want. Suppose right now, well, first off, what is my error term in this example? Yes. Desired minus estimate? Yes. Yep. The error term is D desired minus D estimate. We're feeding in D desired, we're estimating D. Compute the error term. If my error is negative, which way do I want to turn the vehicle? Yes. To the right towards the wall. Do you want to explain? That's right. Did everybody hear that? So if my error term is negative, that means that my estimated distance from the wall is, must be larger than what I want it to be, which means the vehicle is too far to the left. So I need to turn to the right. Before we talked about PID control yesterday, what was the other technique you talked about? Bang bang. If I wanted to write a bang bang controller, this is how simple it is. I would compute this, right? And I would say, if my error is less than zero, then u, which in this case is, what, what is my u? Let's talk about that. What is my input to my plan? Angle of the front wheels. Angle of the front wheels. 
choice, right. So you guys, I believe that there's a ROS code you're going to talk to where you give it, uh, you have like an active and staring angle, right? Yeah. So that is your U in this case. So if my error is negative, that means I want to go to the right. So then my U is just going to equal some steering angle to the right in the case of bang bang. It can be your max. So we could just call it max right. And if my error, let's just say otherwise, what is my U? Max up. Okay, pretty simple concept. So, too far away from the wall? Great. We're going to tell the car to turn as far right as it can and get closer. Eventually, the error term is going to flip signs because now we're driving towards the wall. And so now we need to turn left. And so what you'll get is this oscillatory behavior if you were to implement this, where suppose, suppose this is my projection of D desired. This dotted line represents where I really want the car to be traveling. You'll find the car will get over here, and then it will do something called overshoot, meaning it's going to go past your desired position. And then you're going to turn left, and then you're going to shoot again, and you're going to turn right, and you'll do that. For some applications, that's okay. Sometimes oscillations are no big deal, and it's worth it. We talked about air conditioning yesterday. It doesn't need to be particularly complicated. Because the rate at which the output changes, i.e. the temperature of a room when the air conditioner kicks on, is really low. So you don't get these wild oscillations in temperature when you're turning an air conditioning unit on and off. Okay. But, for your application, you want a little bit more. So we go to our friend PID control. And PID control will not turn as sharp as it possibly can towards the wall all the time. The idea is, as you get to your target, what should the wheels do? Yeah, start to back off, just like the throttle of the cruise control example, so that you don't have this oscillatory problem. Can you still get oscillations with PID control? Yes, you sure can. For those of you that implemented one, you've probably seen it, and we'll talk about that. In fact, at the end, Mike has an awesome demo where we're going to go through what this looks like on a very uh, very simplified mechanical system, what some of the responses you might see look like. No, now the thing is, the responses you would see in the simulation versus your car, while the applications are different, the concepts are the same. Oscillatory behavior, something called instability that we're going to talk about, overshoot, undershoot. These are concepts that are universal across all systems that you may control. It doesn't matter what the application is. So what you find is time and time again after you implement a PID control, you start to get faster and faster and faster at tuning this thing because you start to get better and better at it. Alright. So let's go back to PID control then. So I'm just going to write this the same equation back on the board. We have KP times E plus ki times that integral term of our error, plus kd times this. And we didn't talk about this one at all yesterday, but we will. de dt. Just to summarize, this guy is your reactionary term. It thinks only in the moment. It looks at your instantaneous error. Here things start to get a little less simple. This integral term, again, is something you'll learn about in calculus. It ends up becoming really important even to understand things like physics. But for our purposes, what this integral term means is it's literally the summation of all your past errors. Every time you compute a new error when your controller updates, you add it to this summation. And this term you can use to get rid of something called what? Steady state error, where you'll find with a proportional controller only, you'll end up with something called a steady state error at the end. And steady state error, again, if I were to plot it, looks something like this. My error comes down, and then it just 
decays off to some fixed value, and I can't get it smaller than that. That's what can happen with the proportional term. The integral term, its job is to say, hey, wait a second, I still have an error here. I'm going to add that to my past history. When I update and take another measurement here, I have an error again, so I'm going to add that to my past history. So what's happening to this term? It's growing. It grows and grows and grows. It doesn't stop growing until what? Until the error is zero. And when you come up and talk to me yesterday about, well, what does this end up looking like? And actually, I made an error in what I said. I said that eventually this term will go back down. It won't. The only way that this term will start to go down is what? Yes. Negative. Yes. The only way for this guy to become smaller is if my error crosses and changes signs. Now I'm adding a negative error to this. And that will start to bring it back down. But again, the idea with this term, in practical purposes, is to get rid of this offset. And it does it because it penalizes steady state errors. It wants to get rid of them because it's constantly adding them up. So if it sees you're always at some non-zero value, it starts to slowly increase your input as a result. Every time, it's going to make it bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually this thing drives to zero and you hit the steady state condition where you look more like this. Do you always need this? No. no. And for your purposes, you may or may not. Do you always need this? Yeah. Pretty much. But I can tell you after class one application where we only have this. But most of the time you have, you have this term, and in fact this is your hardest worker. For the most part, this does the bulk of the control. This guy's designed to get space, rid of space here. Okay. This term. This DEDT business. This is fancy notation in calculus, which means I'm looking at how quickly my error is changing in time. The DE means, you can think of it like I'm looking at the change in my error. How much has it changed? And the DT means how much has time changed? So in essence, I'm saying, what is the rate of change of my error? This term, again, looks at just what is my error right now. This is looking at how quickly is my error changing. Does anyone know why this term in practice ends up becoming so important? Doesn't like prevent like really like quick influx like influxes of delete? Yes, it can. Yes. Like, yes. A lot of robots have momentum, so it stops basically like you were about to keep overshooting, so it like slows it down to get closer to more than proportional. Right. Yes. Anybody else? It can't provide, yes, something called damping. Yes. Okay, all great answers. Yes, so <clears throat> remember how I said that bang bang controller oscillates. You can get that oscillatory behavior. You can get that with PID as well. In practice, this term helps get rid of those oscillations because this doesn't like to see error change. As small as it may be, it doesn't like to see velocity. It doesn't like to see this switching back and forth. Because what this wants, this wants error to be zero. This wants, like in the moment, this wants steady state error to be zero. This term wants your error to not change. It wants the rate of change of your error to be zero. And I'll give you an example of this. Back to your car. Let's suppose Suppose, again, this is our setup. My car is currently pointing to the right. So what's going to happen as the car starts to drive forward to my estimated D? It's going to what? go down. Suppose that right now we are actually at, we happen to be at D desired. What's my error right now? Zero. Suppose I only had a proportional controller. Does it think its job is done? Yeah. Yes, that's the problem, is it thinks it's done. But the reality is my car is pointing to the right, so what's going to happen next time I update? 
It's going to get closer. Did this controller see that coming? No. I had no idea. It said, oh, we're done. We're at zero. Did this guy see that coming? Yeah. Yes. It saw it coming because as we're moving in this line, again, what's happening to my estimated D? It's decreasing. So is it changing? Yes. That gets picked up here. So if the goal of this part in your problem is to get this distance exactly right, what is the effect of this term? What does it do to the car? What is it trying to accomplish? You've answered a lot of questions, and they're awesome, but I want to see if anybody else has a thought of this. What does it mean for my error to not be changing anymore? Yes? To go straight. Straight. The car must be going straight. Right? If you think about it, the only way in which this will work is if my car is going perfectly straight. That keeps my estimate at some fixed value. And because this is fixed, this term is zero. That's the only way. So this guy, trying to get you to the right distance. This guy, trying to make your car straight. What if I only had this term? What would happen? Yes? It would just go straight. It would just go straight. Would it be at the right distance? No. No. So do you need both for your problem? Yeah. Yes, you do. Yes, question? That is an excellent question. Does everybody understand what he's asking? He's saying you have somewhat competing objectives, right? We want the car to be straight, but if the car's straight and we're way out here, does this want to allow you to change it? No, it wants you to keep going straight, but what does this want? It wants you to turn to the right. What the heck? That's where tuning comes in. That's where tuning comes in. Because they have different objectives. And together they can work together really well. But there are cases where, like, this is a very clear one, where they're going to be competing. That's actually okay. Because what does that competing mean? It means that, ultimately, this term says, I'm done, I'm going to apply zero, right? This term says, wait, I need to turn to the right. So the car's going to do what? Start to turn to the right. Then this guy says, whoa, 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 we need to straighten that. What that effectively does in practice, if you have the right gain set, is it makes sure that this doesn't turn your car too quickly. This penalizes you turning too fast. If this just says, I, I want to turn, like, I want to turn super sharp to the right, this will cancel out that in a certain sense. That it'll say, you can't turn that fast, so I'm going to give you a negative added to your positive to make this smaller than it would have been. What that means is you gain something called stability where this isn't allowed to dominate your system. This is like a check on this guy. Always looking at, are you asking for too much here? Are you asking for too wild of a turn? And this will help offset that. Yes? But it also mean like, the farther it is, like, the more powerful KP is, but then, like, as it gets closer to, like, the desired distance, then, like, it starts to lessen, so then the derivative takes over, and starts to, like, kind of, like, soften the... Yes. That is right. And so the further away you are from your objective, it's a very good point, the more aggressive the behavior of the vehicle will be. You'll see larger steering angles when you're far away because this term is much bigger. And this one doesn't care how far you are away, it just cares how much you're turning. Yes? So would the oscillation of the PID controller come from the integral term? All, like even like in this particular example, even if the error becomes zero, the integral term is always going to have a value greater than zero because in the past it had error. So, okay, 
so if we throw the integrator back in, yes, the question is, is that what's, what's causing the oscillations? The answer is it can cause oscillations because of what you're describing. But back to the cruise control example, if I'm driving a car and I hit my charge of 70 miles an hour and I let my foot off the gas, what happens to the car? It slows down. Why does it slow down? Because there's external things acting on my view. Friction, well, friction is somewhat internal. But then there's more resistance of the wheels, there's aerodynamic drag. What that means is, I always need my foot on the gas at least a little bit. The KI term is what provides that always, because it's been summing all along. So you end up with a value where even when I hit my error equals zero, the KI term is still applying an input. And so it can cause oscillations because it can cause you to overshoot, but the idea is that what it really should be doing is just making sure you're driving that error down to zero because it, it is what is going to make it so my foot stays on the gas a little bit. Does that make sense? How quickly my error is changing, right? 
Suppose I took a simple approach to that, where I say, okay, I'll learn how quickly my error is changing. Well, what's my error right now? Okay, I'm going to save that value. Next time I update, I'm going to say, now what's my error? What can I do? I can subtract those, right? So that's the difference in my error, and divide it by how much time has gone by. Does anyone know, and this is not something you get to until a college level controls course, and even then people don't know the answer. So I don't expect it to. But does anybody happen to know what the problem with that approach is? Yes? Can we computationally attempt it so we get to like, keep on refreshing and tweaking and adding terms? Um, it's true. You do need like, a static variable to carry around so you can remember that, but that's actually not the issue that I'm talking about. Okay. The real issue is. Suppose I have a sensor giving me some value. I don't care what it is. It's something that I'm using in my controller. Maybe my sensor that is a voltage and it looks something like this. Okay? So when I'm saying at this time t, I'm going to grab its rate of change or derivative. What I'm really saying is I want to grab its slope right here. And I'm approximating this slope by saying I'm going to take this point and I'm going to take this point. <clears throat> and I'm going to subtract them, get that delta, and then I'm going to look at the time delta. So at my t minus 1 to t, how much time has gone by, and how much has my value changed, and that gives me a linear slope, and that's my estimate here. Here's the problem. If I zoom in on this sensor, it's analog. Analog sensors have something called noise, and you can't escape it. It's everywhere. So if I really zoomed in on this, here's what it really looks like. That is what a real sensor output looks like when you zoom in on it. There's something called high frequency noise. The high frequency noise ends up making this kind of computation, while tractable, very inaccurate. Because as I estimate the slope, what I really care about is like that value. That's like the, the real change that I'm interested in. But on top of it, I have all this stuff, which comes from all kinds of electromagnetic interference. It comes from quantization on the uh, motherboard. It, there's all kinds of sources for why you end up getting noise. But this means that as I do this estimate, I get these wildly different slopes. And it's almost unusable when I put it into my controller. So there are all kinds of tricks about how to get around this where you can apply something called a low-pass filter to try to eliminate that high-frequency noise, that has other issues. But there's something in particular on your RC car that Ken, who's very, very clever by the way, thought of that I did not, which you can use to estimate this value instead. So let's go back to that, and I want to mention this really quick, this is important, then we'll talk about gain tuning. Okay, my car's driving along. I have some estimate of D that comes from what? What sensor are we using? The, the laser, right? So your laser is shooting out these beams. You can say something like, I'm going to take the beam with like the shortest distance and assume that that's my, my E to the wall. Okay. So you could take your sensor value, you could, you could do what I'm describing here, where you say, I'm going to take the value now, I'm going to compare it to what it was before, and then I'm going to look at the difference. But you're going to run into that noise issue. I guarantee it. So the clever thing that Ken thought of is, do we know this, D? Do we know how fast we're going? Yes. yes. Do I know, let me draw this. Okay, so I've got some velocity D. I have some distance D. And I have a wall over here. Do I know this angle, theta? Yes. yes. Because I know which beam is the one that was shortest, so I can estimate from that what the orientation of my vehicle is. And I know this velocity. I mean, you're going to be. I know how quickly I'm driving towards the wall, and I know what angle I'm at with respect to the wall. So it turns out that you can use this velocity and some simple trig to figure out what this value is, which effectively is your DE. DT estimate. Does that make sense? This is a cleaner way to get this estimate than it is to use that sensor. 
Is this going to be a perfect estimate? No. no, it's not. That's okay. It's better than differentiating than than doing what I'm describing here. So this kind of thinking is really, really crucial in engineering. Because this isn't stuff that you learn in college. No one tells you, like, oh, if you have an autonomous car and you're driving along the wall, instead of using this kind of derivative or estimation, you know, use your forward velocity and blah, blah, blah. No. Like, this is, this is on the engineer who's implementing the controller to come up with, someone to come up with. And that's what's so cool and makes it so interesting. OK, so really fast, I want to mention my cookbook recipe for how to tune the game set. Again, these, these three weights. And we'll, we'll talk about what this looks like in a simulation. All right. So, your code up your controller, your PID controller. You have your estimated D. Maybe you've measured it with the tape measure to make sure it seems reasonable. You have your estimated rate of change of, of E. That's all working, and now you want to get this controller actually moving the vehicle. The first step that I always take with the PID controller is start with the low KP and then increase it. How low? I have no idea. Totally application pen. You just start bumping up this value until you start to see your system respond. You'll start to see, as, as you're driving along, you'll start to see your car start to turn. You stop when it's too aggressive. What do I mean by that? Again, KP is kind of greedy and only thinks in the moment. What does too aggressive look like in a controller? It looks like oscillations. So it'll look like something like this. If this is my error term, you see it come down, we'll get something called overshoot, and we'll do this. If my KP is too high, I get something called instability where you'll see wild oscillations that shoot off to infinity eventually. That's how you break hardware. <laughs> a bit there. Okay? So you stop when it gets too aggressive. Then bring in KD. What does KD do? KD do? Again, it wants your car to go straight. It hates seeing stuff like that. So you bump up your KD until you start to see the car respond. Bump it up a little bit more until maybe you get a little bit of oscillation. Then you bring in your KD term and same thing, start to bump it up until you see these oscillations go away. Or at least decrease to an acceptable level. You'll never get rid of them completely. And then three, if I'm going to abbreviate here, because I'm running out of time, if your steady state, SS, error, is too high, then start bringing in the interval term a little bit at a time, and you'll see this effect. You'll see the steady state error start to drop, drop, drop. If you're bringing KI too much, you'll go back to this instability. So this, this is where the intuition starts to get built. Two other ways to come up with gains. One is called Ziegler Nichols tuning. It was invented in like the 60s. It was a more rigorous approach to coming up with these experiments. It doesn't work. The second is something called model-based design, where you have a physics model of your, of your vehicle. And based on the physics model, you can actually prescribe what you want this response to be and mathematically compute what those three gains are. That's something you learn in control here. Does it work? It can work if you have a very good model of your vehicle, and that is very difficult to do. Yes? So is the third one saying that, like, if it's already working fine, Great point. Yes. If, if, if it's already working fine for these two, don't bring this in. The other thing about that is don't bring this in until these are working. This will just make your life more painful. There are applications where you don't want a D, you only want a PI. That's not your guys' application. We can talk about those uh, offline if you're interested. But yeah, that's the basic idea. Yes? So between KD, so you want to either like, get rid of not all the oscillations, but just have like a little, like reduce the oscillation a lot, or you just want to have just steady state error? Um, right, great question. So you can't 
fully ever eliminate the oscillation, but you may be able to eliminate enough to the point where it's not perceptible by you. And it's really, uh, I don't know, maybe your course instructors have a specification of what they want your controller to do, or maybe it's up to you to say, this is good enough. The real question about control, it always comes back to, is what are we trying to do? Are we trying to follow the wall and that's it? Or is there something that we're going to build on top of? Is this something we're going to build on top of? And I guarantee you that's the case. So then the real question is, what are we trying to do next? In order to answer, what does the controller need to do now? I think one more question, and then let's jump to Mike's. You want to set up, and then that's our point. Why is the noise on the sensor specifically a problem for the director and not a problem for the engineer? Okay, good question. Okay, so your colleague's question is, this noise here, why isn't this a problem for here? Okay, it is a problem, but it's much, much less of a problem. Because what happens is, you can imagine, this is my signal, right? And this is, within this band here, like, I might be anywhere inside this band, and there is noise in here, but at least it's pretty close to what I care about, which is this value here. When I start to take the differences of these values, if I were to plot that, it blows up to something like this. Meaning, the derivative term amplifies the effect of the noise. It is much more dampened in the KP term than it is in the, in the derivative term. In the derivative term, this noise becomes dominant over what the true signal that you care about is. Does that make sense? But you will get a little bit of noise in there. And you can lead to instability due to noise. You can have sensors which are introducing noise, and it can be a problem. Alright guys, so what I have, uh, I'm going to show you guys is a uh, quick little uh, demo on basically a mass that you can move left and right uh, using a controller. Uh, so, how many of you guys are all taking physics? Raise your hand. Yes, more or less. Some of you guys. Okay, so, uh, essentially what I'm going to show you here is, uh, we talked yesterday about the bang bang controller. So, you see you guys this block, uh, it's, it's you guys all see that? Can't make it here, but um, then you have this block here that when you when you hit hit go, you can, you give it a reference command, which I can control right here, saying okay, I want this block to go to one, and my control input is basically I can exert a force left or right on that block, and you're gonna see that force in that control effort uh, in the middle there. You'll see that little purple line showing right or left which way you're exerting a force on the block. So, who wants to predict what a bang bang controller is going to do this system? Oscillate. Alright, so ready? I'm going to hit start the simulation. And the box going to go back and forth. Is that what you guys expect or what? Then, so when the simulation finishes, you can see what's called the step response. So, what we essentially did here was we told the block to go from 0 to 1, then this is the system's response to that input. So we see our, our reference command, the green line there, and the block is going up and down, potentially not slowing down. Do you want to interject or? Uh, no, that's, that's great. So this is exactly what we're talking about, right? That you get oscillations, and then it's plotting that with respect to time. Like we said, bang bang control causes oscillations. And so what I do, uh, what I can do with this slider here is I can say I want less. You know, I want less force, I want more force. So if I say, okay, well, I was oscillating, let me try to decrease the force to make it, you know, slow down. That's not going to save us. It's still going to oscillate, no matter how little or, or high the control force is. If you want to go really high control force, it's just going to go crazy. So, now we're going to put it in, in a PID controller. And again, same system, we have a block that's moving we're trying to move from 0 to 1, and uh, let's just start off with the P. And so again, you're, right here you're going to see the proportional control effort show up right here, and the direction is correct, and the magnitude is correct. So however big it is to the right, we're trying to push that part to the right, to the left, that's the same. So, let's put, you know, GAN 10. Who knows where to start? Let's start at 10. So, we see a similar thing. Who knows why? Any guesses? P is too high. What? P is too high. Uh, we can try decreasing P if you like. So if you try to go, if you want to go slower, they go. And it's 
still an oscillator. What does what does the proportional term not care about? The fact of the car, the rate, right? The rate of change. So the proportional controller, it's getting the error to zero, but when it gets the error to zero, it's not accounting for the fact that the block has momentum, which is going to continue a move. It has some speed associated with it. Okay, so we'll follow the recipe here and add a little KD into the uh, into the mix. So let's start that with KD. Big go. And all of a sudden, you remember. Let me hit go again. So watch that derivative control right at the second I hit start. So start. See, it, resi it has a big resistance to you trying to move that block quickly. And you can see right away that the block actually hits the target. And when this finishes, you'll see the nice graph there. So I would actually say it's a pretty good step response. So, you know, you move from 0 to 1 and, you know, you know around a second there. It's pretty good, right? Um, where are you going next? So, yeah, so again, you still get, because of the selection of gains, you're still getting what's called a little bit of overshoot there. I don't know if you guys saw that, but it's still shot past the desired. But the difference in this case is with that derivative term, it didn't then come back and start swinging and then swing the other way and lead to this unstable or undesired oscillation, oscillatory behavior. The derivative term is penalizing change. It doesn't like to see change. It only allows change when the error is large enough to justify it, and that's where this weighting comes in. And why you want to see the block move when it's far away, once it gets close to the river, it turns like we're down here. Instead of making it quickly say, uh, okay, I want my thing to move even slower. You know, I want this to be very slow, no overshoot, uh, and so I'm going to add a lot more dent in there. When you start, you see that derivative term is fighting the proportion the whole time such that it slows the block down. But the problem is, you look at your step response, and uh, you know, it took a really long time to get to where you're trying to go to. So a lot of controls tuning, and we didn't need to actually have zero overshoot. So a lot of controls tuning is to figure out, you know, in my car, is it okay if, I'm, if I overshoot my target a little bit? So you know, if you're driving in the middle lane on the highway, you want to move to the left lane, is it okay if you overshoot, and, you know, hit the, hit the sidewalk, the sideline on the road, or do you want to be very slow and controlled about it and you know, zero overshoot? You know, this is a this is probably a safe way to drive your car, whereas the one that shows how you always know, go, but you know, you're ripping the wheel over, you know, uh, laying out some rubber in the road, but you get there much faster. So that's more of an emergency, an emergency kind of maneuver. Um, and so this is and in this system there's no modeling error. So yeah, you know, there's no reason why our block is not going to go to zero. Uh, or it's not, not going to be able to, there's no reason why our block cannot get to its reference command. Um, so what I'm going to do real quickly is add in a string to the system. And, and just to piggyback on that, so what he's saying is, we talked about the integrated term, right? We have this to get rid of that steady state error. Was there steady state error in that plot that he showed? No, it was hitting its target. Why was it hitting its target? Because there was nothing external acting on that block that we didn't know about. Back to the car example, our foot needs to stay on the gas when we hit 70 miles an hour because we have rolling resistance, we have aerodynamic drag, we have things in the system the controller's not compensating for that mean that we have to keep our foot down. That's where the KI term comes in. So now he's added an external disturbance on the block, which will result in a steady state error. So this is the show going on. So we can see that if you start the block at one, you have the springs pushing the block back and forth. So the spring is always trying to return the block to the center. Um, and so, you know, if we add Debian, or if we have the D term, you can see that, you know, the block is always going to return to the center of, you know, that should go zero. Uh, if you don't have any, any, have any P or I control in there. So, let's start off at zero again and say we want to go to uh, position one. We want to go to position one with both some P gain and some I gain, or some D gain. Big go. And so now you can kind of see right there, you have this proportional effort because you're not at zero, your error is still non-zero. So you still have the proportional uh, effort there, but you have no D and you have no I. Um, and so this will show you exactly what the space error looks like. Hang on, almost done. There you go. So we never reach our target. So how we fix that, you, you see this, that, inter that integrator is going to be constantly seeing this error and saying, hey, I want to get rid of that error. 
So now if we turn on the I gain, we can let it get rid of that error. So you see that integrator kind of winds up and brings us to the target. Yeah, you want to show anything else? No, I think that's great. Are there questions on this? I'll say no more. Can we're more couple minutes over? How in trouble are we? Okay. Zero. Well, we're going to go over to the lab and just kind of get busy. So okay. As soon as we wrap up here, we'll leave that. And just to show you guys what instability, instability looks like. Oh, okay, yeah, good call. Uh, you know, if I say, oh, I want to get to my intended target very quickly, so let's turn up the integrator really high. Let's turn everything really high while we're at it. Uh, this isn't going to be stable. You see that integrator just winds up, and then it's still pushing. And, you know, that can. Maybe you're really happy. Yeah, okay, I'll find it. So, you can make your car go off and do crazy things. <laughs> 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 so, this is when your car is crashed. 